from the waiting room. More allow participants to unmute themselves. Let's not start with that. Okay. Okay. People should be flowing in right now. Welcome everyone wow, to Piano Tech Radio Hour today. And uh, I'll just wait. It looks like people are still loading up on their computers. So I'll wait for a minute to give an intro to our topics. Welcome to Piano Tech Radio Hour, everyone. Happy to see some familiar faces there. Folks from all over the globe, as usual. People uh, staying up late <laughs> in the middle of their nighttime, too. So we appreciate that. We got about nearly 50 people on here. Usually it fills, fills up towards that 100 mark as we go. So uh, I'll get started now. Um, just welcome you to Piano Tech Radio Hour officially and mention that we're brought to you by Piano Technicians Masterclasses, uh, which is a service that brings you live interactive online masterclasses from the best techs in the industry. Uh, you can watch them from your home, learn from them uh, in their homes, from your in your own home. And uh, you can find out more at pianotechniciansmasterclass.com. And then today on Piano Tech Radio R, uh, we have Frederick Chu, a special guest who's going to talk to us about uh, pedaling techniques. He's an incredible classical pianist uh, uh, with a with a a wonderful resume of experiences and I've seen him do some been checking him out a lot lately online if you look him up he's also one of those kind of cutting edge folks who's I've seen him I was particularly interested in your duet with yourself you know using a uh, some automated piano uh, recording of yourself along with it. it was very cool it was very cool it's funny when I was first watching it <laughs> I was like, oh, there's a, there's a screen of you playing a piano behind you. And I just assume it was you. It was like just a close up of you playing that piano. And then I was like, oh, it's the, the video recording of you playing that other piano, which was recorded earlier and the piano is now playing itself. Very cool stuff. I really appreciate you taking things, uh, a man after my own heart, taking things <laughs> into the next century with the tools available. So uh, there's much more I can say about Frederick Drew, but that'll be my introduction. And then assisting him today for our lecture will be Eric Johnson, uh, a very experienced uh, piano technician in the industry who tried to escape us uh, doing a business degree at one point, but he, we, we got him <laughs> back in, in our clutches. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he's just been all over the map in the industry. A very knowledgeable guy. He's been on a p previous Piano Tech Radio Hour, so really happy to have him here. Um, and I think I think maybe the next thing I'll do to kind of kick us off is just flip it over to Eric quickly to kind of explain his why he invited, because Eric was kind of the one who invited Frederick to come on, and then. You can do whatever you want with that time. You can flip it right over to Frederick if you want. <laughs> okay. I'll give the floor to Eric for a minute. Great, great. Well, greetings, everybody. Um, I just want to give a, a quick little background of uh, uh, how Frederick and I know each other. Um, and I want to set maybe a sub topic or a subtext for this uh, is humility. Um, and I find that we, you know, piano technicians work in a very arcane world that's very, tends to be very mysterious to uh, uh, outsiders, including uh, serious pianists. Um, and it's not that uncommon as we get a little bit of skill and get, uh, uh, get to be known that we get to be maybe a little cocky and a little, little impressed with ourselves. Um, and I just want to remind everybody, and one of the reasons why I, I, I I'm happy Frederick's joined us, is that we don't necessarily have all the answers. Uh, we're really, our purpose is to serve the pianist and the music. Um, and it's easy for us to think we know everything. And maybe every once in a while, some perspective comes along that 
reminds us, uh, hey, there's still things to learn. Um, Frederick and I met, I, I was with, uh, Yama, I was the director of Yamaha Art Services for about 12 years. And uh, in that role, I went to lots and lots of piano competitions. And there were lots of them at, at, those, uh, at that time. Um, uh, but Frederick and I met in 1993, which still boggles me a little bit, uh, <laughs> at the Van Cliburn competition uh, in, in Fort Worth. Now, going to these competitions has been one of the real eye openers for me, ear openers for me as a piano technician, because one of the things you learn is how much control the pianist has over tone. Uh, we like to think we're going to voice a piano and we're the final arbiter of how that piano sounds. But uh, I learned, and it was repeatedly driven home, that two different pianists playing the same piano can get wildly different tone out of that same piano. One might sound harsh and uh, 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 brittle, and the other one playing on the exact same piano will sound warm and lush and lyric. And uh, it, it opened my ears and it made me consider uh, lots of things about, about voicing. Um, but I just want to give you a little background. So. Uh, there's always a piano selection period, uh, 20, 30 minutes. And usually in some of these, there's a number of pianos on stage. There's maybe one or two uh, American Ds, maybe a Hamburg D, a Kawhi, and a Yamaha. And the people come out and they get 30 minutes to choose their piano. And the only people allowed in the hall at this point are the piano manufacturer's representatives. So for those of us who don't represent Steinway, it's a little awkward because most people come out and they go right to the Steinway and their whole purpose is just to decide which Steinway they're going to pick. And some people will make a, you know, a, a, a more careful examination of all the instruments. But, but usually it's, uh, if, you're, if you're not with Steinway, you're in the minority. So anyway, we'd been sitting there for a couple hours listening to a number of people come out. And Frederick comes out, who I didn't recognize the name or anything. And he walks straight to the Yamaha and sits down and doesn't get up for 30 minutes. Now, that was a, a a little surprising um, and rewarding, frankly. But I, I, looking back, I wished I had said something to Steinway. I wish I had said something very professional and very uh, sympathetic, you know, like, how do you like them apples, Steinway? Or, or something like, how do, you, how do you and your sons like those apples? Um, but I didn't. I was still a little surprised and uh, gratified. And anyway, that was the beginning of a uh, of a, uh, of a long-term uh, uh, working relationship with a number of uh, concerts in New York and a, num and a number of really wonderful recordings on the Harmonia Mundi. And uh, for the most part, uh, without one little bump in the road, we've been friends ever since. So um, Frederick is uh, an advocate of fully exploring the resources of the piano. And I think that's what we're going to, uh, be discussing today, and the whole uh, most of the attention is going to be on pedaling, and in particular, on the shift pedal. So, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Frederick and uh, let him go. Thank you, thank you, Ethan and uh, Eric for making this happen, and thank you to Zoom for making this possible. It's great to see all of you, and I'm, I'm uh, I have great respect for all of you, and and great uh, excitement actually to talk to you about this. I wrote um, an article a, a few years ago that was published simultaneously in uh, a PTG journal and piano uh, magazine uh, talking about pedal, pedal regulation and pedal usage. And I was particularly happy that it addressed both audiences because I, I feel I'm in partnership with all of you and, and the piano techs in general because uh, even though Eric talked about the fact that, uh, you know, piano techs don't decide what the piano is going to sound like, um, I don't control that either as a pianist. It's a, really a partnership. And I, I have always been extremely curious about the whole physical uh, uh, logistics side of how the piano works. Uh, and uh, more recently, just really coming up with ways to use the piano as it is regulated uh, to create uh, lots of really interesting effects that, uh, that I've incorporated into all of my playing. So I wanted, I, I'm super happy to have this opportunity to talk with all of you about uh, some of those. Uh, and I'd like to start just with my 
philosophy of what makes great piano playing. And it's a pretty simple idea. It's the fact that the piano is really the only instrument. I mean, it's been around for 350 years. Already at the very beginning of it, when it was invented, it was the only instrument that can do it. It's still really the only instrument that can do multiple notes sounding all independent of each other, all on, on different spectrums, uh, pitch. You now you can have two notes, they have diff two different pitches. You can have two notes played, one can be played soft, one can be played loud. You can play two notes, one can be short, one can be long. You can play one note with a harsh attack and one note with a soft attack. Uh, there's many, many spectrums where multiple notes can be played on the piano simultaneously with different settings in those spectrums. And because of that, the piano is really uh, a unique instrument in that it can multitask or the pianist can multitask. Uh, and I'm not saying at all that it's superior to other instruments. Uh, it's an uh, incredibly important complement. And on a philosophical level, we all know the joy of you know, being in an ensemble or working in a team, uh, being in an orchestra or a choir, doing chamber music where you collaborate with other people. And there's a great thrill in coordinating two individuals or more individuals and coordinating their desires and their, uh, their efforts to create one bigger thing. So all for one. Uh, the pianist is the flip side of that. You know, this whole being able to collaborate is an important social skill for humans to exercise. The playing the piano is the flip side. It's, the one for all. One pianist sitting on a piano can play two things. <laughs> they can do it, a melody and an accompaniment. In fact, probably at the very first lesson, even before a person knows how to play the piano, the teacher can say, play this note and then play this, these, these chords and already immediately you're multitasking. And it's not, you know, everybody multitasks. All musicians multitask to play their instruments, but the pianist, consciously multitask. And that's a very different kind of thing. And I think that it's one of the very few human activities that's so pleasurable, so rewarding, so uh, motivating, that is a uh, conscious multitasking uh, activity. And I think that on a very deep philosophical level, it's a very important activity. And so thank goodness the piano was invented 350 years ago and it's still around today to allow us to do that. So on, you know, that's a very grand kind of thing, the importance of the piano and, and the basic idea that we're, as a pianist, we're trying to exercise this multitasking element as a performer, of course, but also as a listener. I want to encourage the listener to hear this set of notes as a melody and this set of notes as an accompaniment. And maybe this set of notes as a, bass, ostinato, that, you know, and you have multiple accompaniment voices or multiple, you know, like a duet in, in both hands. Um, I want to exercise that multitasking skill in the listener as well. That's really where the pleasure and the satisfaction of, of playing and listening to piano music comes from. So this boils down to some very basic things. I talked about the different spectrums that the piano uh, and the pianist is dealing with uh, loudness, duration, pitch, uh, rhythms, color, attack, release, all, the, all these things are elements where by having two different notes do two different things, we can hear them as belonging to two different categories, being in two different buckets. Uh, and that's the challenge. And so my use of the pedals, and we're gonna focus on pedal usage, uh, towards these towards this goal of helping to distinguish between notes so that we can color or identify with some kind of characteristic these groups this group of notes with some characteristic and this other group of notes with a very distinct other characteristic so that the listener automatically thinks these are separate things and i'm going to start listening to them and tracking them in different ways 
And I'm going to share a screen very quickly here. Yeah, as you work on that, um, wow, which is very quick. <laughs> but uh, I just want to express my appreciation for having you here, uh, which I think it may be obvious, but it's great to have pianists involved in Piano Tech Radio Hour and, and any of the things that we do uh, that are interested in collaborating with us. And I, I think that's one, um, I don't think it's unique. I think there are other pianists out there that are thinking this way, but there's probably not that many. You know, I love how you express your concept of performance and piano and sound as a collaboration between technician and instrument. We, I, I think I speak on behalf of a lot of other people, we appreciate you having here having this conversation. Thank so you. I just wanna take a minute to say that. Thank you very much. So this is a little bit, uh, a kind of a table. It, it may be very obvious, uh, but for me, uh, this is how I'm thinking. Uh, in dynamics, the shift pedal affects dynamics. You play a note with it depressed, it's gonna be softer, quieter than the same note played at the same velocity without the pedal on. Damper pedal also affects dynamics. The pitch range, uh, I marked the Sassanudo pedal because the Sassanudo can hold a note and keep that note going while other notes are playing. And so it becomes much more obvious that there are two different kinds of notes when they're being sustained at the same time. Uh, shift pedal and damper pedal don't have anything to do with, uh, don't have any effect on the pitch. Uh, articulation, Sassanudo pedal has uh, a lot of influence on that. Damper pedal has a lot of influence on that. Uh, color is affected by the shift pedal and the damper pedal. Uh, in more in detail about it's affected by all three of the pedals. And for that reason, I wanna talk about that specifically. And that's a kind of a concept that, that I'm, I've developed. Uh, and then timing uh, is uh, affected by Sassanudo pedal. And if anybody has any questions, please just, you know, just speak up. I'm happy to, to make this a discussion. Let me see if I can. Okay, so this is interesting to think about it. And this suddenly became clear to me uh, as I was trying to understand how the pedals influence those spectrums. There, you see a natural use level here and a traditional use level. So traditionally, let's talk about the damper pedal and a, a technique that I'm sure all of you have heard of and, and use, which is flutter pedal. Yeah, you know, flutter pedal is basically not keeping it on, not keeping it off, but kind of going back and forth to be able to lessen the effect, but not in a very concrete way. So just being kind of at that middle point on average. You know? I like to think of flutter pedal technique as if you were trying to organize a really nice romantic dinner at home, with your partner, your spouse, and the light in the dining room is too bright. And so you set up a strobe instead. And you have it going on and off. And that's basically not full lighting. It's not totally dark either. It should be a very romantic kind of halfway point. But of course, it's not. It's extremely irritating on the, on the, on the contrary. And we, so we have this, this nice invention called the dimmer switch and you set the dimmer switch at the level where you think you want the light. And if it's too dark, you raise it a little bit. And if it's too bright, you lower it a little bit. The damper pedal in its traditional use is a strobe light, but it's not a strobe light. It's actually a dimmer switch. It's an, what I call an analog, I describe it as analog, where from one end to the other end of the spectrum, it's one continuous evolution from on to off. The more you press down the damper pedal, the more the effect of the damper pedal uh, becomes uh, obvious, which is letting the strings vibrate. So uh, there's no moment anywhere there where it suddenly shifts into something else. So I like to call that analog versus a digital where it's on or off and you have to choose somewhere between, uh, you have to choose between on and off and nothing in between. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about 
I'm going to leave Sasanudo pedal out of the discussion today because it's it's uh, it's complicated and it doesn't come up uh, in use very often. Although I would encourage all of you to always look to make sure the Sasanudo pedal is working on all pianos because I've found most of the time pianists don't notice when the Sasanudo pedal is not working because they don't use it. And most of the pianos that I have played in concert, I would say the Sasanudo pedal is not well regulated or not regulated. Uh, correctly and needs to be worked on. So I'll just leave it at that. Uh, let's talk about the shift pedal. So the shift pedal, people do traditionally believe it is an analog pedal where the more you press it down, the softer, the quieter the attack or the volume is of the note that you're playing. And I'd like to propose the idea that it's the digital pedal. It is one that goes from state to state and does not pass uh, calmly and evenly from on to off. And I would like to point out the fact that even great composers like Beethoven had this traditional view of the shift pedal. And of course, back then they were doing una corda and dua corda and tre corda where the hammer actually hit one, two, or three strings. Um, and there's a, a, a iconic moment in the slow movement of the Opus 110 Sonata, where at the top of the page, he writes, poi poi tutti cordi, after having been in una corda for, for a while. And, it's, and there's a dotted line that goes all the way to the end of the page. And so he literally is expecting the pianist to slowly raise the shift pedal across the duration of this slow movement page. And therefore he's thinking it's going to go just from quieter, slowly, step-by-step step, up to louder. And I'd like to propose that Beethoven probably couldn't hear at this point and probably was just imagining in his head and we're all following a deaf person's idea of how the shift pedal should work. And so there's a, there is another thing, another myth to, to break there. Um, and I, I'll get into the detail about the shift pedal. Can I introduce a quick question here? Yeah. So Ed Whitting asks, uh, flutter pedaling, is there a brand or brands of piano easier to accomplish this on than others? And, or, and or are there models with in a brand or is it very individual? To actually flutter, flutter pedaling. Like any, I think any, you know, in thinking about it, I think any damper mechanism should be able to execute flutter pedal. It does depend on the pianist foot. And there's a point where the damper has no more contact with the strings and so no matter how much you flutter above that point, it's not going to do anything. And there's a point where the dampers don't leave the string, you know, they're damping everything. And so uh, below that level, it, it won't make a difference if you're fluttering either. So anywhere in that sensitive range, the flutter pedal technique should work. Does that answer the question? Yeah, thank you, appreciate it. So let's, let's, I want to talk about the shift pedal a little bit. And these are discoveries that I've made over the years that I've, I've kind of tried to focus uh, and uh, really codify. And it's become a way for me to really use the shift pedal in this uh, digital way. And I would like to propose that there are at least seven different colors that can be seven very distinct colors that can be produced with the shift pedal in different positions. Uh, and I'll just say right off the bat that no piano will have all seven, but all pianos have at least three. It's just a matter of which of these they're ha they would be able to offer. And that really depends on the state of the, of the uh, hammer surface. Uh, so what you're seeing here is basically kind of an exaggerated cross section of, a, of the surface of the hammer where it's been played 
for quite a number of years without anybody coming in and working on it. And you have these nice deep grooves where the three strings have been hitting for, for so many million times. Obviously the felt here at these points is extremely compact. And then the felt here in between is extremely uh, unfocused, it, it's puffy. Uh, it, it may even have been forced up. I don't know if this actually happens, but it may have been actually forced up by the strength of the strings digging in where they have been digging in. Um, in any case, you have a very different surface here versus here. So the first, and I, I'm gonna call these position one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, position one, uh, pretty straightforward. That's no shift pedal at all. The strings are hitting where they hit the majority of the time. It's getting the most focused and loud sound. Three strings being hit by something really focused, really uh, tough. Uh, the next position is that I call position two. And this is something that you don't come across a lot in concert uh, uh, grade pianos, but you do come across a lot in practice rooms in conservatories uh, where the grooves have been really just dug in and uh, they haven't been worked on in a long time. This is created by just touching the shift pedal a little bit so that the hammer is just slightly off. The tiniest bit, even just the weight of the foot on it can do this in some pianos, where the string actually hits the side of the groove. And then the hammer actually, because it's not extremely solid on the, on the, uh, on the lever, it actually kind of slides so that the, the hard part meets the string at the bottom of the treble. So you get this kind of shimmering whoosh sound as it swishes across the side of the groove before it goes boom. So I call this a shaboom. Uh, played loudly, you don't notice the, the swish part, but played softly like in the beginning of. Boxer Lotion of Ravel or a lot of that high WC kind of a re repetitive kind of arpeggio stuff in the treble. If you play that pianissimo with just the weight of your foot on these pianos with these hammers, the sound is absolutely unbelievable. And I, I would uh, encourage all of you to try next time you see a hammer that really has deep grooves before you start uh, voicing it, before you start sanding it, try that. Put, put your foot on it just slightly and as you play this light arpeggio in the, in the treble, just move your foot up and down until you hit that point. You're gonna be like, wow, that's in the piano hammer. That's just incredible. When I find a piano that has that, I'm so excited because I know I can use it. And it's gonna be a rare opportunity. So that's a number two position. Number three position is you're past the point where the hammer will shift a little bit to the right uh, to accommodate the string. And so it's just hitting the hammer, but it's not hitting in the softest part. It's hitting in this kind of middle range. If you sh shift the pedal just a little bit more and you can place it exactly in the middle of the, of the puffy part, then you're gonna get the maximum kind of unfocused sound that you can get from the piano hammer, you know, from that particular piano hammer. And then as you go further past that halfway point, you're gonna get the number three, but on the other side, and this is going to be potentially slightly different because the third string is now going to start possibly coming off the edge of the hammer. And so you're gonna get potentially a duocorda or at least a kind of strange vibration in the third string that you don't get with a three. Uh, and you only get on the other side of the four. If you go next, then you get the shaboom on the other side uh, of the groove. And in this particular case, you should be getting just a duocorda effect of the shaboom. So it's a tre corda effect, 
in number two and the Dewey quarter effect in the number six. And then my number seven position is what I uh, recommend, I would love for this to be industry standard where the two strings, where string one and string two actually coincide with groove two and groove three. And that for me should be the maximum travel of the shift pedal. So you can just push it down and you know you have a focus do a quarter sound. And so you're going from a focus to a shaboom, to a partly muffled, to a completely unfocused, partly muffled with a little bit of resonance perhaps, a shaboom with a little resonance and a little less volume, and a hyper-focused but softer two-string sound. Those seven sounds theoretically are on all piano hammers. But if the groove is not very well formed, or in the case of, a, of pianos that you may see often uh, in your work, this is a picture that Eric said, you might actually have two sets of grooves because the piano has been played so much with the shift pedal just down. Uh, and I found that this happens a lot. You find a lot of these in, in uh, piano conservatory practice rooms where uh, the, the student just doesn't know how to use the soft pedal and thinks of it as a soft pedal and so therefore just keeps it down all the time to do their practicing. Uh, I've seen this also in, in students I've had who are particularly sensitive or lacking confidence. And it's strange that a kind of psychological condition will reflect itself in the hammer, but they're very sensitive to people listening to them practice. And so they also think that this, the shift pedal is a soft pedal and they'll just automatically put it down at its maximum travel uh, to get the least amount of sound coming out of their piano when they practice. Now, so this kind of condition uh, will show up a lot. And then of course your whole position one through seven is all messed up. Yet, there will still be positions. And this is what I'm saying uh, when I said earlier that no piano has all seven, but all pianos have at least three. And in a case of a hammer that's worn like this, you at least have two sets of grooved focus sounds and some kind of puffy sound in between where you're not hitting a groove. No? So all pianos have at least three distinct sounds uh, no piano has all seven sounds uh, as far as I've encountered. So now the challenge, of course, is as a pianist, how to control this and how to use this. You know? And one of, my, one of my sayings is if you can't reproduce it, you can't use it. There are incredible amounts of variety in piano sounds, but if it's random, if it's just because of some random thing that's happening in the resonance of the acoustics or the resonance of the, of the instrument itself, and you can't reproduce it, well, then you can't plan on using it. And therefore it's not a musical tool anymore. Yeah? I'm interested in things that can be repeated, even if it's extremely difficult to repeat, but if it's repeatable, then it's of use to me. Yeah. Uh, so I, I just want to show, I'm not sure exactly how well this sound, uh, you know, the sound quality is gonna come across on Zoom, but I just wanted to uh, sh share, uh, and, I, and uh, you'll see in one of the windows. It didn't I, sound too bad when you were playing previously. It, okay. I mean, you weren't playing for very long, but yeah, it, I'm going to play something through. Okay. To that. Yeah. In fact, I'll, I'll play that to, to demonstrate uh, to start off. Uh, there is a, a participant in this Zoom, which is my iPad focused on the pedal. So I don't know if, if some of you are particularly interested in the timing of the pedal. You can pin that window and, and see that. You can see my feet there. Do you think I should pin, uh, make that the spotlight? Well, we can take your, um, if you're done with the presentation, we can definitely remove that. Yeah, let me, let me take that off. And then I'll look for your pedal and maybe I can spotlight it. Uh, 
for and folks. I'm going to do something. So yeah. there's the there's your lovely Crocs we can see. So. And I pinned the virtual background as a reference there. It's just the there you idea go. Of what I was talking about. Nice. So what I was playing earlier, the Unbarcelosiana is a perfect example of where I would use uh, the shift pedal. And I'm just going to demonstrate basically a position one to four, which is the most uh, standard kind of use. It does incorporate the idea that one is louder, four is quieter. Uh, but then there is also this added element, which has nothing to do with volume, which is that one is focused and four is not focused. Yeah. So the Unbraxo Lociano has this undulating arpeggio figure. can't see my piano with the background on. Maybe I'll turn that off. I'll turn that off for now. So there's an undulating figure, which we want to be kind of like an atmosphere. I, I want it to be not very distinct. It's not a, I don't want it to be like a bunch of notes. I want it to be a harmony that kind of swells and disappears and swells and disappears. So this suggests to me very naturally a kind of a four pedal position, yeah. But this is a place where if I had, did have a position two or six, I would use that. I don't have one on this particular piano, so I'm gonna just use a four, which is going to be a kind of nice muffled, unfocused sound. Mm -hmm. In addition, to this accompaniment, there's a kind of an ostinato in the treble. I'm going to let pitch and rhythm help me distinguish these two things as two separate elements. Now, this is natural, it's just musical. Ravel has already planned it this way. There's a moving line that's con constant and then there's this rhythmic thing that's a little bit irregular and it has two notes playing at the same time and it's high. Ravel is using a whole bunch of different spectrums to help distinguish these two things. Now Ravel adds after three repetitions of that, he adds this singing voice that's in the middle range between the left hand and the right hand. And of course, this is a technique that lists use where you're using your thumb and different fingers of both hands to share the responsibility of playing that middle voice. The way Ravel has written it, he's put a little accent on it and he writes en dehors, which means a little outside. So he wants this note to, to ring out and be separate. Most of the time, pianists would do this with accenting. They'll just make it a little bit louder. And of course, because it's louder, it's going to be distinguished from the other notes. And so it would sound something like this. So there's this three layer effect. And the more you can distinguish these three layers as a, as a performer and make the listener hear it, the more amazing this experience is. It's already we're like, oh, there are two things happening. And then all of a sudden this voice kind of floats out from the middle of all of that. And we're wondering like, how is that possible? So the effect, that's the effect. I'm going to now use the shift pedal one and four in a technique that I call surgical shift pedal, where I choose for every single note that's being played, what position of the hammer 
I want to play that note with. Most of these are going to be played in position four, but that melodic note in the middle, when it comes, I'm going to play that in a position one. It's going to be a very quick little pedal motion because all I need to do is catch that attack and then I can go right back to a four. Uh, but you're going to see, hopefully, through this uh, audio setup, you're going to see that melody note really coming out in a focused sound that's not only louder than the rest, but also has a different character. how much of that came across that's really cool it has a, almost like a plucking kind of feel to it now you know? yes like yes a... because of that focused attack that you don't get with the other notes yeah and i'm playing it with a, a particular touch to emphasize that but i'm getting results because the pedal is also going in that direction you know so it's a... you know what it reminds me of uh, how a guitar player will uh, choose to pluck the string closer to the bridge mm. of the of the guitar and it gives it like a like yeah. a more plucky sound a more yes, sort yes, of yes. Uh, uh, like a, a sharper sound and Very versus nice. a rounder sound when you pluck more towards the resonant holes in the in the uh, in the guitar. I like that. That's very, I, f I found that very noticeable and very touching too. I mean, it's incredible, Frederick. I, I really like the way you, you approach music is very touching. I can really feel, well, it, feel it. One of the, one of the things that I uh, gain from doing this using the focus characteristic to help distinguish notes is that then I'm not forced to play that melodic note louder to make it come out. Yeah, which then does not restrict me to a piano pianissimo range for the arpeggio and a mezzo piano to forte range dynamics for that melody note. I can actually have a larger swell, dynamic swell in the accompaniment and still keep that character of a position four. And I can increase the range of the melodic shape like that the end of that melody, I can really taper that down dynamically and play that last note very quietly, but it's still distinguished from the accompaniment because it's a position one. So a note can be quieter, but still be a position one, and a note can be louder and still be a position four, and we're not as con we're not confused by that because dynamics is not one of the main spectrum that's being used to differentiate these groups of notes. Frederick, just to just to clarify, when you're playing that, your left foot on the shift pedal is in fairly constant motion, right? Because you're you're shifting it to pick out the melody note and then you're reshifting it for the accompaniment, correct? That's right. Yes. So uh, let me let me use another example which is much more direct. This is uh, this is one of the Chopin etudes, Opus 25, number one, Aeolian Harp. And this is an etude for arpeggios and how to bring out a melody above constant arpeggios. So this seems like a perfect tailor-made etude for Un de l'Océan of Ravel. So basically the music is... Melody, and this is, you know, Chopin etude. That is the technique. That is, those are the, the forms and the notes that Chopin is going to use throughout the whole piece. And so how do we distinguish that top note from... So I'm going to, and I'm sorry, my right foot is kind of covering my left foot. Let's see if I can... 
not hide it as much so you can see. There we are. So that's my my shift pedal over here with the big cloud hopper. Uh, so I'm going to play the melody basically with the shift pedal in position one. So shift pedal off. And get a nice, solid, focused, ringing tone. I'm also going to accentuate that with my, my attack. I'm not going to need to play it louder because the clarity and the focus of that particular sound is going to ring out. It's also higher in pitch than the rest. So it's naturally going to stand out, but I am going to use a position one for that. And then the rest, I'm gonna use position four. Yeah, so when I play the top note, just before I play it, I'm gonna lift up the pedal, just enough time to play the note and then immediately press it back down. Yeah, in this particular case, I'm pressing it back down to a position four, which is not all the way down. If it was regulated to just go to the, to the hill of the groove, uh, then I could just press it on and off, on and off. In this particular case, I know where it is in the descent that I have to stop to get that maximum kind of puppy sound. So I'm gonna do it very slowly and you're gonna see. It's a very quick motion. It just flips up a tiny fraction of a second, just enough time to play that note in a position one and then come back down so it catches everything else in a position four. And when I talk to pianists on uh, how to think about this, I, I liken it to swimming. If you're doing a crawl and you have your face underwater, you know when your face is underwater. And you know, when you have to tilt your head and take that little breath, you know, when you're above water and you, you take that breath and then you go right back down. That melody note is your mouth out of water and you're just going. And it's, people are, are a little bit daunted by the idea that the left foot is moving so fast. But in fact, the right foot, we've trained it to move extremely fast. If I'm doing a pedal, uh, I'm playing that with one finger, but getting a legato because I'm using my right foot to help sustain and creating the connection between the notes. And it's going very fast. And it's the same technique. It's a very quick thing just for the attack, just to be able to catch it. You know, so there's a, there is a training aspect to this uh, that I have to talk to pianists about to, to get them used to the idea of, uh, of playing. Yeah. Um, it was very helpful to see you do that slowly. So thank you. For yeah. That. So, you know, the, the Chopin etudes are, they're studies for things. They were not meant specifically to help train the left foot in the surgical shift pedal, but I've transformed it for that because it fits very, very well. There are others uh, like that as well. Uh, open step number 11. You have a long arpeggio that's all position four, except for the very last note of the arpeggio, and you want to have your foot up just for the last note. And then the last note rings because it's a position one in the context of a position four. Yeah. And the more closely you can make the notes that are in the different categories, the more closely you can make them sound, the more you're putting them next to each other and the difference becomes more obvious. So if you had a whole section of a piece that was all position four, and then another whole section of the piece that was position one, 
basically it's like, okay, this part of the painting is gonna be done with a blue pencil and this paint, part of the painting is gonna be done with a red pencil. What's really interesting is if the whole painting is done with blue and red, like right next to each other, and you can see the red stuff in the blue stuff and the blue stuff in the red stuff. Yeah, so it's the proximity of the different colors, the ability for the pianist to put them almost just side by side where we can really start seeing within that very narrow microcosm of the piano sound, you can start seeing those infinite differences and really start hearing like orchestral uh, variety, even though it's all piano sound, which is actually quite, uh, quite limited. It makes me think of some of the, when I go to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City, they have a musical instrument collection and you can see, uh, I, I don't think they can demonstrate them for everyone, but we did a tour and they demonstrated some of the, just various implements they have tried on pianos, you know, where you could put almost like a little buzzer sort of, yeah. I, I, it was like a distortion pedal. Yeah, on, yeah, yeah. You know, like, it's very or a interesting. Strip or a paper strip or. Yeah drums and and uh and sticks yeah so let me uh let me peek in here and say uh we we have just about eight minutes left um it's been really great uh as far as everything you've presented there's a couple of questions i just want to make sure people who are uh interacting will get those things across um and i want to share um, a, a couple more slides for piano okay. tech specifically okay cool um, do you want, do you mind me giving these, throwing these questions out quick? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, one of them said, um, how do you, something, the adjustment to different strength of shift springs, more heavily weighted actions? I think the gen, I think the general question, I think there was a few typos in there, but how do you adjust to different weighted actions and springs for shift pedals and things for like the shift that? Pedal. Yeah, that, pressure? that's what I'm working on uh, in the shift pedal area with piano techs is to make sure it's sliding, gliding freely and easily. Uh, that often requires taking out the key bed and, and putting some lubrication. Uh, and then that, the, that nut at the end that determines how far it travels, uh, that always requires a little bit of regulation uh, because it's never positioned exactly you know, in my idea, where the two strings hit the the two grooves uh, in the in the uh, furthest position. So those are are things. I you know, it's really irritating to me when there's a grinding sound or a squeak in the shift pedal. That just bothers the hell out of me because, of course, I'm using it so much, and nobody else will use it as much and so quickly. And so the sound doesn't bother them. They may not even notice, but for me constantly using it over and over again and needing it in sometimes as, as in these pieces in some of the more quieter passages, because that's where the difference of the focus and the unfocused really comes, uh, becomes the most obvious, you know, then any grinding or, or, or uh, squeaking sound is just like, oh, awful. So that I would definitely point out. Um, thank you for the answer to that. And uh, I've seen different comments and questions flooding in now that time's running out. <laughs> so, um, and one of them is, you know, hopefully uh, people are saying maybe we could have you back to talk about so uh, Sasa pedaling or something like that. Some other comments just to say that some, you know, serious students should all have access to this. I know you've done some classes like this. Um, I don't know if you've made them public, but you I have, have some things on YouTube. Pianist. If you go to my YouTube channel, uh, there, yeah. there are a few uh, tutorials on and I'll, I'll just put out the intriguing idea of a half sassanudo pedal, which, uh, which I uh, discovered, mm. Which, mm. You know, which I haven't seen in any pedal manual anywhere. Interesting. Can I just um, point so something I'll... out? To, can I point something out real quick? Uh, Frederick's playing on a, a relatively new Yamaha CFX, a concert grand. And I can tell you the piano sounds much better in live than it does I'm sitting here cringing a little bit because it sounds a little harsh. I just want to let you know it's yeah the the true range and scope of the color of that piano is not necessarily coming through on uh, on Zoom. Thank you for sharing that. Um, 
So I'll just say really quickly, we put in links in the chat there for the feedback form for this episode. So make sure we get your feedback. We put in a link so people can join Del Foundrick's uh, masterclass on refurbishing soundboards with epoxy that's coming up next week and um, a link to join our next event uh, guests to be announced. Uh, but if you want to pre-register for next week's event, then go, go for that. And then I'll just turn it right back to you for the last couple of minutes here because it seemed like there was something you wanted to, some things I you really to wanted to share. I want to share this slide, which is my kind of fantasy tool. I have no idea if this is a practical tool or not, but basically it reinforces the idea of how I would love the shift pedal to work uh, using this to voice where at the same time you're airing out the middle parts and you're strengthening, actually strengthening the, the grooves in a hammer. Uh, obviously this can be done with just traditional tools as well. You know, it's just a matter of understanding the, that grooves actually have a particular characteristic and it's very hard to recreate them uh, immediately with tools. It really does depend on long-term use. And once a piano is conditioned uh, and seasoned, it's a real shame to just go in and just sand it all off and start with fresh flat hammers again. Uh, so this is just, you know, kind of a, a, a fantasy from a pianist's perspective, having no idea whether <laughs> this could actually work uh, in real life. So well, I, we do I, have some tool nuts out there. So okay, well, maybe. if somebody maybe. invents something that actually can, at the same time, strengthen grooves and and puff out the puffy parts in between, that would be amazing, and I would love to hear about that. Yeah, and just a quick tip that Susan Klein mentioned is if you do want to make the grooved areas uh, impacted more, uh, you can you can with a you know gloved hand or something towel, you press down on the strings themselves and then play the notes. And then that mm. will make sure that the strings don't push back and that can sort of make mm. the grooves a little tighter. Interesting. Okay. All right. So yeah, we just have a couple minutes left. Any any parting words from Eric Johnson or or Frederick? Um, I'll just put it to Fre uh, Eric first because I know he's kind of in the background there. Anything you wanted to say in in parting, Eric? Uh, no. It, it, I, I want to just say one thing about sesame noodle pedal because it, it came up early in the careful regulation of the sesame noodle pedal. Um, uh, one of the one of the quick ways that we've learned as piano technicians to check the sesame noodle is to push the damper pedal down, raising all the dampers, push the sesame noodle pedal, and then let the damper pedal up. And theoretically, all the dampers should stay up. And the problem is, you know, we can get fooled as piano technicians into thinking, oh the saucy noodle pedal is working, but you got to understand that's not the way the saucy noodle pedal is used. You can have it working perfectly that way and still not have it function correctly at, from a piano standpoint. And the only way you can check, uh, make sure the saucy noodle pedal is working is to play each in individual note and then push the pedal and make sure that that individual note is held up by the, the pedal. Don't be fooled into, uh, this can be a, a disturbing experience, sort of like, sort of like a shift pedal. You know, when you get the whole piano settled and the pianist comes in and hits the shift pedal and all of a sudden you've got all these voicing problems, uh, just you know, uh, think in terms of pianistic terms as much as you can rather than just pure mechanical terms. But uh, no, this has been great, Frederick. I appreciate uh, very much this uh, explanation and demonstration. My pleasure. I, I'm so happy to have this opportunity and I would love any, any feedback. You know, this is a continuous dialogue. I consider continuous dialogue between me and, and all piano techs uh, because I think that there are things that, uh, you know, all pianos should function better so that it encourages people to play and encourages people to listen. In the end, it's all about, uh, you know, continuing this amazing trajectory of this amazing instrument. So that, that, that's my goal in any case. Excellent. Well, that's a great note to end on. Uh, we really appreciate your time, Frederick. And again, uh, just the general interest in the collaborative approach to uh, making music. And, uh, and again, kudos on your, your abilities and your commitment to making beautiful sounds it shines through. So uh, yeah, without uh, further ado, I'll, I'll be signing us off. And uh, for those of you that um, registered for Piantech Radio Hour subscription. The recording will be available in our um, 
in our member area and uh and frederick will keep in touch we'll be in touch we'll see if you can come come do another another radio hour or perhaps even a master class would love to okay love to. cool well, you, we'll be in touch and we'll we'll see everyone later thank you eric talk to you later all right goodbye